you're going to have a bankroll so big when you walk down the street, it's going to look like your pockets got the mumps. You see, Pimpin's big business, and it's been going on since the beginning of time. You don't know nothing about mapping. Everything you need to know, you got to get from me. Goldie, Goldie, Goldie. I said, well, who is Goldie? I don't know. Even... The fact that the film even got made is a miracle. Every film is a kind of journey, and every film has its difficulties. But this was the ultimate. Ladies and gentlemen, the map of the year! First few movies come through and really touch real subjects in a real manner. The Mac is a film that we did about a particular code called the pimping game. We took a slice of life and we presented it as realistic as we could. The film came about because a guy named Bobby Poole had a treatment that he took to Harvey Bernhardt about a guy who gets out of prison and uh, it starts, you know, pimping women. The Mac really started with Bobby Poole writing on toilet paper in prison. I used to lie in that stinky ass four by five cell looking at those dark walls. I went to meet Harvey, who was this strong, forceful, interesting guy who said to me, we gotta make this movie. I was intrigued with the idea of how a guy can control a bitch's mind. That's what they call it. I just can't get it in my head how a bitch can walk the street every night. I couldn't comprehend it. Max Julian just fell right into the role. I know he made sense to me. At that period, I was writing and co-producing Cleopatra Jones. And they called me in, and Harvey Bernhardt said, you can, you can write it, you can bring in whoever you want to bring in, and I'll give you final say-so on whoever is cast in the film. And I said, great. Then I went up and I sat and we talked to Michael and I realized he was a sweet human being and also a political human being. And Michael and I sat and I said, we, what we're gonna do is put this thing together and we're gonna make some political statement. That's what Michael and I set out to do. Black Oakland was a war zone. It was incredible unemployment. It was volatile. People were being shot on the street. That's the climate that we had to face. We wanted the film to be a statement that America is never going to be whole and complete and healed unless people recognize the condition of black people in America. I had really started in the documentary world, and my background in documentaries really affected what I did with the Mac. I said, I got to go there, Harvey. I got to be there. He seemed put back by that a little bit. You know, what do you, what do you have to do that? Bobby Poole's draft, which was very interesting, just gave us a sense of what was there. It didn't give us a complete picture. I've got to get up there. I've got to see the reality and find out what the real story is. Bobby Poole met me in Oakland, and um, I said, we got to meet the Ward brothers. we got to meet Frank Ward. The Ward brothers were four brothers, black brothers, who really ran underground Oakland. In a way, I think they really ran Oakland. When I met Frank Ward, then I knew that the picture had to be made. I mean, Frank Ward changed my life. And I think changed all our lives in many ways. Frank Ward! He was a marvelous guy. He could have been anything he wanted. If he walked in here right now, you'd have to like him. He was this great, strapping, beautiful-looking cat, and you could feel his power. But he was a criminal, a serious criminal. The real question was, were the Ward brothers going to back us or not? Why should they? I mean, we weren't anybody. We were this dawn patrol, this strange group of people coming from Hollywood. He said, what's in it for me? You know, I said, well, uh, I'm not the producer. I'm not the money person. I'm the director. My job is to get... And he says, no, you don't understand. What's in it for me? And I said, well, I'm sure we can work that out, but immediately I think you've got to be in the film. I saw in Frank's mind that he was the Mac, you know, that maybe this film was really going to be about him. Okay, my man, let's understand one thing. I take you in my world, you take me in yours. I show you what I do, you show me what you do. Frank opened up all the doors so I could go anywhere. There was so much material that I was getting from Frank and from Frank's permission, it was incredible. It was electric. You could feel the energy in the streets. You could feel the danger. 
could see the potential of the movie. I went back to Los Angeles to meet with uh, Max Julian and Richard Pryor. And the bitch is fine. Harvey, I told him I wanted to bring in Richard Pryor, and he said, no, 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 Richard Pryor's too crazy. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, Richard been beating up people at that time. He said, oh, you can't bring in Richard Pryor. No, 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 he's just too, he's a maniac. I said, I promise you, I, I promise you I'll be responsible for him. That's the only reason he hired Richard. We would sit with Richard Pryor, who was tremendously helpful in the script. We wrote the last five drafts of the script basically Max and Richard and myself. It's about a human being who got out of jail and was trying to figure his options in life and he thinks, aha, because he's bright and he thinks this is the way I can get out. So here's a film that allows you to take that trip with this human being who says, if I gotta be a pimp to do it, I will be a pimp to do it. I think the Mac is uh, distinct in uh, spearheading the subgenre of pimping. Goldie, you know, I need a man, you know, I need somebody in my corner, man. Pimp with flashy clothes and all of that is in fact a celebrated character in the black community. It's a black guy making a lot of money off a woman who's selling her ass. I want you to get yourself together and get back out there and get me my money. Controlling their minds, he's Fingali. I'm gonna be everything to you. I'm gonna be your father, I'm gonna be your friend, I'm gonna be your lover. A pimp was like an intellectual because it's all about using your mouth for persuasion. Anybody can control a woman's body, see? But the key is to control a mind. See, a real pimp doesn't use his hands. He came from his head through his mouthpiece. And if his game was tight, it persuaded and influenced others around him. And they were drawn in by virtue of the game being spit out of his mouth. In this organization, there is a president, a director, and a teacher. All of these offices are held by me. Our culture is fascinated with the camp because there's a great deal of truth in his rap. You want to be me. I mean, you'd like to have my clothes. You'd like to take my money and get in my big car. And in fact, You'd even like to look like me. Pimps exist, and they don't exist on the street, they exist in the boardroom. I'm sure Golden got caught up in, in this kind of life and it started tasting good to him. And then I choose you. But didn't get the idea that he was one of these people that had said, one day I'm gonna grow up and be a pimp. Goldie came in riding a bus, and he left riding a bus. I mean, that's just ass out. <laughs> I always saw him as a lost soul, as a lost person. And he's trying to find an identity for himself. I mean, I got a right to live my life the way I want to live it. I mean, being rich and black means something, man. Don't you know that? Max Julian understood kind of intrinsically what the role basically could be. I started out in Washington, D.C., going to school, and I was just a normal, average, bright kid. But I've always had this affinity and curiosity about the dark side. I guess I sort of leaned toward being a gangster, but I was too bright to ever end up in jail. You know, I used to think you were smart. I mean, I, I thought you had the brights. Mac Julian was meant to play that part. And he has that character and the way he talks and everything like that. It's like perfect for the movie. There's an incredible excitement about you. Something very powerful. Yeah, I had those good feelings about you when I first saw you. You know, people don't associate him with anything else but, but the Mac. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mama. I'm sorry. The emotional life of Goldie is me. You can't deny that. That's who I am. The story with it is that Max's mother was actually killed. April the 27th, 1972, my mother was murdered. Goldie. Juanita Moore was nominated for an Academy Award for Imitation of Life. I worship her as a human being, but she really didn't mother me. Is it really you? <laughs> I needed her at that time. <laughs> If you really look at it, there was a sadness about me throughout the whole film, because that's where I was as a human being, and I couldn't hide that. That is me. And I think that's really what people have related to. We're living in different times. When you and I were young kids, I mean, there were no heroes. He's still the hero to this day. And he's not a hero because he's a pimp. And it's sick when you get a chance to get out of a rat-infested ghetto and you don't. It's because of that other thing that he has, that indomitable spirit that he has that you cannot stop me and you cannot mash me down without me coming back at you. <laughs> Dr. 
documentary has really prepared me for the Mac because Oakland was a battleground and you had to be really prepared for anything. We tried to focus in a basic area which encompassed uh, San Pablo, MacArthur, Telegraph, a whole stretch of downtown Oakland. There were two conflicting powers, both sides struggling for control of the city. The Ward brothers were so huge with their drug dealing, and they did, you know, they weren't just pimps, they were drug dealers, they were major drug dealers. Over here on the left, on the other side, is the Black Panthers at the height of their fame of Huey Newton and Bobby Seale and Elaine Brown. The Panthers were running the entire city politically. They were not letting drug dealers on the street, they were just helping old people cross the street, they were feeding young kids. I already knew Huey Newton. Huey Newton was a buddy of mine then. The uh, police in our community couldn't possibly be there uh, to uh, protect our property because we own no property. I met Huey Newton when he really was a pure revolutionary, really trying to make a difference in this world. I loved him. I thought he was most, one of the most extraordinary people who ever walked the planet. We have, first of all, got to protect our brothers and sisters from themselves and from those within the community that would rip them up. The brother role was fashioned around Huey. Most of that stuff in the middle where he talks about they steal our hairstyles and da 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 those are Huey's words. You have his brother who's coming on this black nationalist tip, you know, it's about consciousness. In order for us to make this thing work, man, we've got to get rid of the pimps and the pushers and the prostitutes. We can't get rid of one without getting rid of the other. We got it's about, you know, revolution. And here's Goldie saying, you know, that's cool, but nobody's putting me out of my business. I mean, not you, not the cops, nobody, man. I mean, you want to get rid of the pushers, I'll help you. But don't send your people after me. That split, I think, continues to exist in the black community. Which way do we go? Do we go the political route, or do we go the underworld route? I think the conflict existed in Olinga, too. I mean, I had turned him into a killer. He became a killer, don't forget. The conflict exists in everybody. He was when I became a gangster himself, unfortunately. You want to stay here. You want to complete your film. You got to deal with us. It's not enough to deal with the War Brothers. If there's a film, if we are in their territory, we are going to pay. I got hit on the shoulder, and the fellow, I turned around, and I said, what is it? And the fellow said, the, the man wants to see you. I says, who's the man? He said, Huey Newton. And I said, well, I'm not interested. He says, well, the man wants to see you. I told him, fuck off, you know. I was in my hotel, and boom, the door went flat and walked Bobby Seal. And he said, you're in, you're in Panther territory, boy. I said, so what? I said, I got the Ward brothers to protect me. And he says, they ain't shit. I thought he was going to kill me. I, at that moment, I thought I was dead. And we decided that we had better meet. Huey Newton. I don't remember the details of that meeting except for Harvey is a very pompous person. Harvey is a very confident human being, and he thought he was doing them a favor by even coming to visit them. He didn't know who Huey Newton was and didn't care. He said, I don't care about no breakfast program. I'm helping people across the street. I don't care what who he is. He ain't nothing but no dumb militant. I said, he's not dumb. I had a security guard who was black and three guys with guns downstairs. As I went up in the elevator with Max Julian, I said, and on the way up the elevator, I got to be crazy. I've got to be crazy. Nuts. Then Huey Newton walks in, and he said, I'm only going to be off for 5000 So I said, well, that, that's better than nothing. So I wrote him a check for $5,000, and the check bounced. So I, my life wasn't worth a nickel. One day I go out to start shooting, and the bottles start flying. The, from the rooftops, bottles, glasses, anything you could throw comes raining down from the roofs. Not only do we duck for cover, we grab the camera, everybody scatters. Ralph Woolsey was a DP. Sir Ralph and his crew, this was a, this came as an incredible shock. Frank was so enraged because he felt that the picture was his picture. Uh, we were under his protection, not the Panthers. I never knew what was going to happen. I never knew if we were going to get our work done because either somebody would come and take the equipment, as they did once when we ran out of money. You know, they just came and grabbed the camera and put it in the truck and carted it off. That was that. We didn't have very much money. We had almost no money. $200,000. 
cost. It was a picture paid for on diner's cards, you know. And if that meant we had an hour to shoot something, we had an hour. If that meant we had five hours, we had five hours. I had 3,000 feet of film per day, let's say. That meant if we ran out, we ran out. Diane, your timing is off. And I kept on saying to myself, all right, master, close up, two shot, master, close up, two shot. The energy was pouring in. And I, I think that energy helped to, to build something on the other side of the camera and the actors. You ever seen a nigga with a bitch from Hawaii? Never. Got your motherfucking man, come here. When I had one who was six and a 35,000 plus one plus six leaves seven. $35,000 and seven, right? Motherfucker, can, can you, you buy, buy that? <laughs> the thing that holds up to this day is how how real it is as far as those characters and the dialogue. Yeah. I heard something about that. You know that? Somebody shot him up with battery acid. Nasty. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. I heard they took some of that weight off his ass. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The bitch walked in with so much money I had to give him. A big truck to help me. I... <laughs> you laugh at how amusing they are as characters and how they talk and their mannerisms and the way they might do a little something. <laughs> I see you haven't changed much. <laughs> Still look like a little grease ball. This is what I think makes the movie stand out even now, is that the dialogue was just so serious, because a lot of it was improvised, you know. Please! When they get broken down by the cops, pretty Tony, he goes, get your hands off me. I'm a rich, rich nigga. nigga. I, I got, got lawyers, lawyers walking, walking motherfucker. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Next, Next time, time you hear grown, grown folks talk talking, and shut the, the fuck, fuck up, up, you hear? Like, I'm not running because I, I ain't, ain't no, no track, track star. star. And then he tells a fat man, listen, you vicious, vicious ass, ass piece of jelly. jelly. I mean, think about that as a diss. Vicious ass piece of jelly. That's like just originality, you know? I was playing one of them, don't forget. Frank Ward. He stayed around us to make sure that things were right. That's what I was doing. At the ball, when, when Goldie wins the play, I went like, ah, blah, blah, blah. And he, 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 he said, no, 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 no. You're too cool for that. Hey, hey, how you doing? Everybody just came right at me like, bam, you know, you had to, so you had to bring your best shit to the, to the table every day. You, you ain't no pimp. You're a rest haven for hoes. You're a car thief, a car thief. I didn't want to do a cartoon pimp because uh, I know some pimps and my, my brother was a pimp who was quite a device <laughs> of the film. No, man, all bitches are the same, just like my hoes, you know? I keep them broke. Some of the style of the pimp I got from my brother and other people. Fuck is this? I got too much money for this shit. I thought you paid these poop butts off, man. I try to get under characters and and find some truth in it and follow through on that. Go get it, Bob. Bring that bitch here. Freeze, nigga. You want to die? Richard Pryor alone, you know, just doing his thing high out of his mind was uh, was amazing, I think. Richard was very much, you know, knowledgeable about this world. So he knew these characters and he conveyed all that in the film. The scene we did where we go outside and they say, um, OK, start running. Come on, nigga, run. I ain't running no run you, no. Just run down the street, nigga. Kill me here, man. You want to kill me, motherfucker, then off me. Kill me, you know what I mean? All of his anger at the cops who had bothered him and all the people who had ever abused him, because he was very abused as a child, all of it came out. Yeah. You motherfucking punk! You punk, Goldie! I love the scene where Richard and Max are at the bar. How'd you do, nigga? Well, I made believe <laughs> I couldn't ride a horse, right? Oh, man! <laughs> that scene at the bar, we made that up on the spot. You know, and then we had to remember what we made up. You show us some titty too, nigga. I know. You like that? You like that? He was good. He was great, but he was difficult. It was definitely a drug problem, a serious drug problem. He was on coke, and he was he was just fucked up, and he wouldn't he wouldn't listen to anybody. He didn't show up. He would show up two hours late. He was wearing us crazy, and, and suddenly Harvey would say, Max, you know, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, and, and then that fateful night. The next thing I know, I mean, there was no fight, there was no argument, he comes across the lights, and he cracks me one on the jaw, and I fall. I remember seeing stars, I remember that. How'd you like that blow? Did I, did I get him? Did I really get him? That's what he thought of. Goldie, I can't believe you, man. Split. So Harvey called and, and said, you know, you got to send him home. I ain't bullshitting, brother. We gonna get him. 
punk ass motherfucker. Hutch did a very beautiful soundtrack. People don't talk enough about the contribution of that music. It was my first movie score. In Michael Campus, it was never f further than a telephone call away. Michael cared about that film, and so he was right there. Well, Willie, I think you should do this here. I think I want a song like this here. I used drummer, percussion. We used horn. <laughs> Three guitars on it, two keyboards, it would have to have a great bass line, and all of these things, uh, once you put them together, you know, like in a melting pot. The player's ball. I was just thinking about having a great time, you know? I was trying to give it something to keep the spirit up. Brothers gonna work it out. Brothers gonna work it out. It was gonna give them an attitude. You know, everybody's living for the betterment of each other. Whether it's brothers gonna work it out or that music under the mother. That stuff is so haunting, you know, it's so haunting. And that's what Willie did. The thing that I loved about the Mac was that it was all about the costumes, definitely of a time. Max Julian was really crucial to this. Max had a great design sense. A lot of clothes came out of his head. Oh, look at you, wow. When the Mac came out, and I told Harvey and I told Michael both, we got to get something that's going to snap their attention. Because we got, our whole thing was to outdo Superfly. Wow, goddamn, you look good to me. Do you hear me? I was part and parcel of the designs for the clothes. The first thing I told them is I know these two guys, Marcus and Doom, they did all of the clothes for everybody in the movie. That, that had some sort of style. Everybody assumed some young white guy had done it. Oh, yeah, well, there's two young black kids down in South LA named Marcus and June, and they, they said, oh, uh, hmm, oh, really? Um, hmm, are they a member of the, the union? <laughs> hats made out of crochet, hip mobile hats, four inch brim rims, bell bottom pants, leather jackets, imitation leather, fur. They basically were using all of it. This stuff is fun, it's flashy, and it's cool and defiant. <laughs> Borsalino hats were my style. I wore them when I lived in Rome. The cape that Max Julian wore was a perfect choice that the designer chose. He shows up in the neighborhood to give all these kids money, and he's got this Pied Piper cape on. The white coat was my idea. Now when people wear white coats, all rappers wear white coats, and they um, immediately, it's their Max style. That coat which is the symbol of the picture, the symbol of Goldie, really is a reflection of Frank and the wards and that world. Apart from Max and Richard and a couple of other people, those are the real guys. They're women, they're cars, they're dress, they're life. They made the picture. Without them, the Fulmini pimp would be absolutely no good. First thing was the barbershop. I put Frank in the barbershop with some of the other guys. Oh, she's a beauty. Oh, man. Yeah, well, you know how these little young Max are around, man. They don't have the shit in order, you know. The minute Frank Ward opens his mouth, you know that he's a real pimp. Oh, man, shit. Well, you know how I am. I'm gonna run my thing, you know. This is all about the money game with me. I do mine from Frisco to Maine. I mean, the game just, uh, just, you know, just jump it off the man. Let's take the pool hall when, when Goldie comes back from prison. It's the players, it's the guys who hung out there. Did you see it? Did you see it? Yeah, son. It's not some Hollywood crap. That scene where Goldie catches Pretty Tony, he thinks that he's killed his mother or whatever it is, and he makes him stick himself with the cane. In reality, there was a guy who had turned somebody in on a drug deal, and they had a, a sharp knife, and they made him stick himself. Okay, now stick yourself. Come on. Come on, Goldie. Stick yourself! Ah! Stick yourself again! That was a real incident that happened. All we did was just transfer it into the film. 
As far as the rat's concerned, not only did it happen in Oakland, but it's happened in other places. Oh, no! At Players Picnic, which was very popular, one of the most insane days I've ever seen. It was really a real baseball game played with real people who were stoned. They would do that. They would have, every year they would have a player's picnic. Everybody who was close to Frank and close to the wards came and did that scene. But the scene that mattered most to Frank was the player's ball. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Larry Lane welcoming you to the 8th Players Convention. We see the documentary style seeping into the Mac, particularly the player's ball scene, where you can see the handheld and you can feel the light on top of the camera. Also, they look at the camera. Gun. A lot of people look at the camera. Nobody's like, you know, holding it against the movie. It feels real. For me personally, it was so fascinating because I've never been in a room where everybody in there was extolling the greatness or the joy of being a criminal. Most of the people that were legitimate, I shoot your daddy crowd. I mean, they really were criminals. And you went out and hired real policemen to block the streets. And and those those real cops knew that these were gangsters. First runner up, Frank Ward. Frank would say to me. I should be named the player of the year, not Max. I'm, a, I'm the player of the year. Max can be the runner up. In all absolute honesty, he say, I am the peacock. I look splendid. And I don't want you to ever lose sight of that. I am the peacock. <laughs> you look at a scene of the player's ball and you say, my God. There were all those players. That's not a set. Those are the tables, those are the walls, those are the people, that's the feel of it. It works because there's a truth to it, because the costumes, the clothing, is what people were wearing. Going from clothing to cars, you have to have the best ride. Frank said, I'm gonna have a ride built. He said, I, I, I want a swimming pool on top of my car. I mean, how could they compete with that? That was a real car. That was Teddy's car, into the Wonder War Brothers cars. They had a shops in Beverly Hills that were copying that pimp mobile and selling it to people in Beverly Hills. Cars, clothing, every piece of this fabric is intertwined. This is the truth. This is real. We were being hit on all four sides on every day of the shoot, not knowing what was going to happen. The Panthers are over here battering us. The underworld is over here battering us. The lack of money is over here battering us. And at one point I went to Frank and said, Frank, man, I don't know if we can finish. And I thought Frank, Frank would like this with me. You told me you wanted my protection. You wanted me to support you. I gave you my word. You gave me your word. You make this movie, man. You finish this fucking movie. There was no way out. There was going to be an ending, and it wasn't just going to be an ending of the film, it was just going to be an ending to that phase of everybody's life. Unfortunately, Frank was killed, which was the which is beyond the tragedy. Frank Ward was murdered. Uh at about two in the morning with his girlfriend, shot in the back of the head. It had to be someone close to him. I think it was uh, uh, done by uh, orders of Huey Newton. But I think so, but I couldn't prove it. The accusations were just wild, like wildfire. You know, oh, the Panthers had him killed. And somebody said it had to be a drug deal, a drug thing, because he was killed in a car with a girl and it was like an assassination. Somebody shot him from the rear. Frank would never have been in that situation with somebody like Huey Newton. I liked Frank, and I really believed in my heart that if Frank had chosen another way of life, he could have made a major contribution to the world. You know, he was one of those kind of people, he was an extraordinary human being, you know. Everything began and ended with Frank. Frank was Goldie. Frank was the picture. I mean, he was, in my mind, the heart and soul of what we were doing. And he was the tragedy, not just his death, but the tragedy of Frank's life, because Frank could have been anything he wanted to be. 
And so on the last day, it was clear that we were going to have to go back to L.A. Uh, and finish this film. Everything, everything that was possible that could have gone wrong was going wrong. We went back to L.A. In the end, the first screening of the Mac in Oakland, the screening that really launched this picture, the Black Panthers came and said, you will have the opening to benefit the Black Panther Milk Fund, or you won't have an opening. I didn't need to be hit over head with another club. I had been hit over head with so many clubs in the course of the film. They said, you're absolutely right. I think we have to honor the Black Panthers, and the opening should be the Black Panther Milk Fund screening. And it was an amazing night. There was such anticipation in the street, that sense of electricity, that sense of excitement, that sense of something's about to happen. People went crazy. And they had had a previous screening. They had a screening before we got there. And there were people, there were hundreds and hundreds of people standing outside. And they went crazy. They went bananas. When the lights went down and the film comes on, the audience just went completely crazy. They talked to the screen. They talk to the characters. They talk to each other. The audience literally tore the uh, seats from the balcony and threw them down, had to have police uh, guards. It was just popping when the music was going. I cannot tell you the people that stood up in the theater and just cheered this movie. They were just so taken with it. The same thing. When the guy kills me, the audience applauded. They went bananas. Now the house lights come up, and a woman came up and slapped me. Who the hell do you think you are hitting, hitting brothers like that and beating them up? And the husband said, this is a movie, darling. It's a movie. The lead was an African-American. He was... He was the star. What's more, he's a pimp. They're gonna have to rewrite the the, 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 the Mackin game book, baby, you know, because I'm gonna be the new king. Was it possible not to realize that we had a hit, that we had something that was going to be totally unusual and, and special? I mean, I knew when we did the movie, it was gonna be a hit. I didn't have any doubt about it. But we put it together because the element was right, the timing was right. The Mac could not have missed. When the Mac came out, there was a lot of criticism. You know, black exploitation. How could they do this? They just did it for the money. There was the, the finger pointing and saying, white producer, white director. That's bullshit. It didn't matter to me that some white guy was directing a film, unless the film was demeaning to me. Here was a number of films released during a relatively short period of time. So many of them are being made that, you know, it becomes a joke. Might is my name, and fucking up motherfuckers is my game. No shit, baby. We were absolutely blasted by the so-called white establishment. It's about a pimp. I let a bitch get away with something last night. I shouldn't have let her get away with it. How could it possibly be doing anything good? The Mac is deeper. It's not just flash. It's not just criminal activity. It's a social commentary. It's a million miles from where I came from. It's a million miles from those cold cuts and that filth and that dirt. It was not black exploitation. It was a slice, a fragment of life in America at that time. I think the power of the film is that the fact that we told the truth. Goldie arrives with nothing and leaves with nothing. The black American people came and said to me that they thought it was an insult that I would do a film about a pimp, especially knowing me politically. Have you ever heard anybody come out and say that the, the Godfather should never have been done? Never. I said if Ron O'Neill and Max Julian had starred in The Sting, it would have been called black exploitation. Because of the dichotomy that exists in politics in the world, period, we can't do what, we, what, what our white counterparts can do. None of it makes sense, man. None of it. Tell those people, those millions of people who love it and whatever, that it's a black exploitation film and it shouldn't be seen. This movie has a long, long life, well after it came out, and I think hip hop is the main reason that we're sitting here talking about this movie today. So many hip hop artists have embraced the Mac and also pimping as a character trait. When you think about a pimp's primary tool being his mouthpiece, what is a rapper's primary tool? his mouthpiece. He has to spit game out of his mouth and he has to do it in a convincing fashion. You got your game and I got mine, okay? So when you listen to Too Short, for instance, back in the day, he was the first rapper to come out, you know, just pimping 
and his whole persona was about pimping. Think about somebody like Snoop. I'm in a three-piece suit, looking real cute, mashing, crashing, looking for a prostitute. Puff Daddy with his style of the clothes and the, the P. Diddy line. I mean, come on, that's right out of the Mac. Hey, man, don't you realize in order for us to make this thing work, man, we've got to get rid of the pimps and the pushes and the prostitutes. You get sample dialogue on the Chronic album, the first Chronic album, Dr. Dre album. You know, and there's so many no-name rappers out there, too, that reference the Mac, and some have songs called the Mac. I was sitting in the car with my son, and he put this CD on, right? And when he put the CD on, we're sitting there listening, and all of a sudden, I hear brothers gonna work it out. It has people talking, people are still talking about it. I run into it every time I walk out in the street. People come up and tell me what it, how it has affected their lives. There are so many bootleg copies of the Mac. I've seen a copy where someone was running it on a VCR in their home, and someone else had a video camera. They showed it to, hey man, I got you on TV. Come here, come on in, come on, turn it on, baby. Your car thief, a car thief. <laughs> <laughs> they know my lines. I, I can't remember the line. I had a taxi cab driver pick me up. He quoted every word of the Mac. He knew all the music of the Mac. Anywhere you go and you mention the Mac, it's just astounding. I was at the market about three or four weeks ago. The woman working at the deli said, Oh my God, you play China Doll. Oh my God, I don't believe it can have your autograph. A guy would be walking toward me, African-American guy would be walking toward me. You played the cop in the Mac. You were in the Mac. Oh, yeah. It happens to me quite often. But I've never had a white person come up to me and say, you were in the Mac. Never. Not once. What's the answer? How do we survive? How do you survive a ghetto? How do you survive a situation? What is the answer? What is the future? I'm gonna get my stuff together too. I got some things I wanna do. I promote radicalism. <laughs> I think the only thing that's gonna change anything is being radical. And the Mac is a very radical film. And it's sick when you get a chance to get out of a rat infested ghetto and you don't. Whatever it takes to get your point across, to get to that platform, to do what you gotta do, and that's why the Mac remains. And that's why it's gonna keep remaining. Change the way